Unique message to labor. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Tonight, Mike Stenhouse from the Center for Freedom and Prosperity here in Rhode Island is here to discuss a message for union members that, hey, you know, you can opt not to join. And it's going to cause quite, uh, uh, if this conversation amidst some crazy news cycles actually catches on, it's going to cause a lot of strife. Um, well, I should say controversy. Strife is, is perhaps not an accurate uh, portrayal, but uh, Mike is here to explain what his position is and a new marketing program to reach out to union members. I'm quite certain that labor leadership would like to have a response to this, but first we'll lay the table. Nice to have you in on a min Monday evening. That is definitely, uh, are, you late, are you allowed to say Indian summer anymore? Is, is, is it Native American summer? Or is that when we get, we get to, uh, whatever. It's going to be hot as heck over the next few days. Uh, a reminder that, uh, you know, global warming is, uh, I'm kidding. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's get to the tough news for the country, right? Uh, John McCain passed away this weekend, expectedly at the, uh, the age of 81. Here's the latest from the network. Flags remain at half staff over the U.S. Capitol as the country prepares its final farewell to Arizona Senator John McCain. Tributes are pouring in from around the globe and here in the U.S., where former President Barack Obama said he and McCain shared a fidelity to something higher. And former President George W. Bush described McCain as a patriot of the highest order. Both men had been invited to eulogize him Saturday in Washington. Any comment on John McCain, sir? Flags at the White House are back at full staff, and President Trump is not expected to attend the funeral. He offered sympathy to McCain's family in a tweet. Here in Phoenix, McCain is being remembered as both a hero and a legend. He'll lie in state at the Arizona Capitol on Wednesday on what would have been his 82nd birthday. McCain served his country for more than six decades as a Navy pilot, a prisoner of war, and a longtime senator. Later this week, his colleagues in Congress will honor him when he lies in state at the U.S. Capitol. I'm just hoping that both sides of the aisle will take inspiration from John's life and message. A private funeral will take place over the weekend in Annapolis at the Naval Academy Chapel. Uh, quite the life, no doubt. Uh, not a perfect guy by any stretch, and he would admit it certainly early in his life as well. I, uh, I happen to know a handful of military guys that didn't buy his act either. Uh, and so uh, he would, but he, he, he definitely fought for what he thought. Uh, some people call him a warmonger, uh, and then others think he was too close to Obama. And then others say he just kind of took a pass on his presidential race rather than fighting it to the end. And da da da, and da da da, and da da da. But you know what? These are all of the things that. Uh, people will say about you in real time. You know, when, when somebody of this, uh, no doubt, military courage uh, and his POW experience stands uh, historically, um, unlike many others in the world, uh, you'd think that we would get presidential commentary other than through a tweet. In fact, President Trump today, uh, after a press conference on a new deal with Mexico, wouldn't even offer a word, not a word. Anyway, um, Godspeed there. Let's come home and talk about what uh, has been the conversation for the last week. And it has, it has been a, a dandy, no doubt. Here's the headline today. Pain relief, DOT to open two lanes on Route 90, 195 West. Let's remind ourselves where we were last week when in the midst of the turmoil and back up on 195 West, Governor Raimondo was asked about her perspective. Are you prepared in any way to pull the plug on the 195 Washington Bridge project, given all of the turmoil and the traffic problems there? No. You're not going to tell the DOT to stop it? No. Bill, is there anything that can be done to mitigate uh, the traffic? That's DOT. DOT. A, traffic, a traffic engineer I am not. Uh, that didn't fly. Uh, I was standing right in front of her when she said that, and I just couldn't believe her face, which was kind of like, uh, no. Meaning, she really didn't even know what was going on. Three days into the problem. Uh, Peter Alviti, the director of the DOT, who last week had an attitude of, hey, you know, 
you got to pay the piper. You know, you know, it's like the frame oil filter. Pay me now or pay me later. You say, hey, we got to fix this bridge. It's 18 months. You know, we got the worst bridges. You don't want to fix it. I mean, really, you know, it's this kind of, you know, hey, yeah, you know, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. all of a sudden somebody gave him a humility pill. Uh, I don't know what the dynamic is between he and the governor, but somebody must have communicated a couple of things. A, he was heading down a really, really, really bad road, and B, the governor is going to get dragged down with him. Yesterday, he had a press conference. We're pushing the pause button. Rhode Island Department of Transportation Director Peter Alvidi announcing a large part of the $22 million Washington Bridge project is being put on hold. We're committed to making this project as painless as we possibly can for the commuters here in Rhode Island. But for the last week, it hasn't been painless, with drivers stuck in major backups, sometimes all the way back to the Massachusetts line. So now, RIDOT is working to alleviate the traffic. As of right now, three lanes over the bridge are open. Now, RIDOT plans to open a fourth lane for cars entering from the Taunton Avon ramp in time for the Monday morning commute. Crews have been working on that lane throughout the weekend. It will not require them to merge quickly into, tr into the main flow of traffic. Then, to try to alleviate the congestion even more, Alvidi says a fifth lane will likely open Tuesday morning. That will pretty much put us in the pre-construction condition. According to Alvidi, with other road projects, drivers have adjusted to changes put in place for construction. But with the Washington Bridge project... A congestion persisted. Uh, it did not correct. The project was originally expected to be done in fall 2020. Alvidi says with this pause, it could take a little longer and cost more, but should save commuters time, adding that time is money. There's a trade-off, and uh, we're working to find that sweet spot. Yeah, the sweet spot. Now, he, he, he elaborated on WPRO this morning on the Terry Granahan show, and I just have to play this, because this, this, this kind of understanding about the totality of economics on this, you know, our investment as citizens, commuters, employees, workers, and all of this condition, which is always factored in, we look at cost on a project, uh, not only in terms of the construction costs that uh, we incur, but the cost that it incurs upon the public, the motoring public. And, um, you know, one minute of lost time uh, during a rush hour every day for the next 18 months for the people in those 70,000 vehicles a day that go by this work zone would amount to tens of millions of dollars in lost income or inconvenience uh, during the duration of, of the project. So um, we have, you know, have a responsibility to keep our eye on that. And we, we were hearing from the people uh, that were stuck in the traffic. We were getting reports ourselves of delays uh, upwards of 20 to 90 to 100 minutes, depending upon the route that you took into yeah. Providence. And, and uh, the cost of uh, to the consumer, to the to the traveling public and to the businesses who need to move their goods and services uh, is considerable when you're getting those kinds of delays. So um, it's a trade-off, you know, that we're making. Uh, the delay will cost us a bit of money, but nowhere near what the cost of the public would be if we uh, kept the delays in place. They couldn't get an ambulance through. Okay. That's pretty heady stuff. It's amazing how smart they get after the public has had enough. It's amazing how much perspective they get after the public has had enough. Uh, imagine if the public got that upset about lots of things that aren't necessarily as tangible as an hour delay on 195. Imagine. All right. Very good. Uh, let's uh, get into our discussion for this evening. Here's the headline that uh, has got a lot of people talking. Uh, group launches campaign to encourage union disaffiliation. Give me the executive summary and welcome Mr. Stenhouse. Nice to see you again. Thank you, Dan. Actually, the headline's incorrect. We're, we're not encouraging disaffiliation. We're encouraging uh, public union uh, workers, that's state and municipal employees, to be aware of their rights. 
so they can make the decision whether or not they want to disaffiliate that's best for themselves and their family. So the headline was wrong. We appreciate the coverage the journal gave us. So. Hmm. All right. Well, why don't we leave it there? We'll come back and we'll discuss what the intent is in our next couple of seconds. Stay with us. All right, so we've uh, established that you're not encouraging disaffiliation from, uh, from union membership, but you are encouraging via website to review it. Tell us what, tell sure. us what, this, uh, what, what the legislative and, yeah. and, and regulatory environment is surrounding this, this, this message. Sure, let me give you the quick the back story. So yeah. we knew the Janus decision for a long time. There was a much anticipation it would go the way it went. Janus is the decision out of The Wisconsin. Supreme Court, no, no, the, the Supreme Court, uh, Illinois worker uh, that was decided late in June. That, that granted, basically it granted right to work to all public employees. Oops. <laughs> it's happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, many of the think tanks uh, in my network were, were designing campaigns like ours to inform workers of their rights because we know when right to work was passed in other states that unions would do their best to make sure workers didn't know what their rights were so they would not know that they had rights and couldn't be punished if they opted out. And we really didn't think we were going to get involved until July, until the governor went out publicly and said, we, we want to hide contact information from outside groups, hint, hint, saying we don't want them to know their rights, want them to stay ignorant and in their unions. And when we started getting calls from some people saying, well, you know, I asked my union this about the Supreme Court case, and they told me this, like they told me if I opted out, I'd no longer be eligible for a promotion or for overtime or that the, Jan the Supreme Court case didn't apply to Rhode Island or didn't apply to this union. That's flat out false information. So we quickly regrouped, we called one of our national partners and we decided that just like we defend the rights of Second Amendment or First Amendment constitutional rights for everybody, that, that public workers needed to have their rights defended as well, but they first needed to be informed what those rights were. And that's the genesis of this my pay, my say, R-I dot com well, the, the, it, campaign. Didn't, didn't the original conversation have to do with not wanting to participate with union dues based on the political behavior of the unions? Well, the Supreme Court, that was the basis for the Supreme Court's ruling that right. A, everything a public union does is political because it involves taxpayer money, and B, no person should be forced to have their money go towards supporting a political position they disagree with. So that was the basis of the whole Supreme Court ruling, was a First Amendment rights issue. Right. But how does it break down now between the money that is that is allocated for politics and the money that's uh, allocated for negotiating? It doesn't matter now. You're either, you either pay the whole fee or you pay none of the fee. So right now, that's, that's what the ruling says. It used, used to be that you could deduct. You, you could, used to be you could ask for a refund of those dues that were spent on pull. You had to ask for a refund under a, Beck, a case called Beck's rights. But now there's no such thing as agency fees or, or, or fair share fees. You either pay the full union fee and you're a member, or you don't pay anything and you're not a member. I mean, so what does it do to the status of an employee if they're not paying union dues? Nothing, really. Um, they still are a member of the collective bargaining unit. Uh, a future case could change this. In fact, there are some lower court cases already happening where, because right now there were two things. Public employees were forced to be represented exclusively by the government designated union, and they were forced to pay something, either a fair share fee or a dues. The so Supreme Court says you can't be forced to pay. The question of exclusive representation might come up in the future, but still members are part of the collective bargaining unit. So whatever union members get for benefits and compensation and seniority and status, non-union members get. What they don't get is uh, they don't get to vote, they don't get to go to union meetings, you know, they don't get to do union things. But, they st but all the benefits uh, they still get that are negotiated because they're still being represented by the union even if they're not paying, and they can't be recriminated against. That's the important thing. They cannot be recriminated well, you know, if I, you choose not to pay. I, I don't know what, what, what recrimination is in, in, in this context. What, well, what, like, is, what is recrimination? Well, there's a lawsuit in Westerly right now with, with some uh, members of the uh, sheriff or police union down there. They didn't pay the union, and they claim they were denied getting overtime jobs. 
Uh, you know, so things like that. They could be denied promotions, right? So, so there are things unions can do and have done in other states and apparently are doing in Rhode Island, and, and that's the kind of recrimination that would now be totally illegal. It's also a cultural problem. True. At work. I mean, you know, would I make that decision? I don't think so. I, I, I don't think I don't think I would need the day in day out stress and aggravation. You know, you and I are uh, doing the same kind of work inside the union. I'm not paying dues. You are. Um, the resentment, I'm sure, is palpable inside these unions. And that's each person's decision, and we respect that decision as long as they know they can't be facing any other kind of official recrimination. But in other right-to-work states, anywhere between 15 and a third of union members do decide to opt out. So there is some safety in numbers, I guess you would say, that if enough people opt out, you know, we're, we're, you know they're going to harass everybody. So, um, but that's up to each, each person. We respect their rights. We just want them to be aware of what your legal rights are, what your constitutional rights are. Go to our website, read about it, and you decide for your own. All right, you got some, uh, you got some pictures and graphs you want to show us here? Uh, what, what is it that, uh, uh, first of all, this is an ad that you guys are putting out. Union members now have a choice in paying dues. Yeah, so it is, it's called the My Pay, My Say campaign. It's your paycheck, and you should decide. Uh, whether you you should have the final say as to whether or not you want to join a union. And, right? and what else? We have a, we have some other uh, pictures here. What, what is describe this whole graphic for me? Well, this one is something that we're going to expound upon, and we're we're trying to get the final research together. It's going to take us a few weeks, but what this basically says is where the unions spend your dues. If you're a public employee, in this case, it's the uh, the American Federation of Teachers or the NEA. You know, a good hunk of your dues go to national, their national parents. And, and we were surprised when we saw where some of the radical left causes of that money is spent on. And we're going to enumerate that and put that out in a report. Because a lot of, because to your point earlier about union members not being forced to pay to political causes they disagree with, well, they don't know what those political causes are. We're going to show them. And then they can, that will be part of the information we'll be giving them. Right. This all has to do with public employee unions, public not, only, not not private. Government workers, state, municipal level only. Not not the private trades. No. Yeah, I, I just you know it, it's a tough time for organized labor in general. Uh, feels like they've kind of lost a little bit of their mojo, and 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 I'm sure that they're uh, very resentful of of this decision, and and no doubt your little marketing campaign here to to orient people to other options. Well, like we said, they would apparently prefer to keep their members in the dark and treat them, if you would, like students and children. We think uh, public employees are adults and can stand the truth, and we'll make the best decision if we give them why, the truth. Why, 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 why position it that way? Why position because it? Because it's true. History in other states has shown it, and early indications in our state that keeping employee, that, that They keep their employees in the dark and treat them like children. Yep, and and I'll take it even one step further, and they'll intimidate them. I don't know if I don't know if we have this graphic, but we can talk about it now or in the next one. But there's a letter that Go Local Prov broke today in the news that we've called. We made some calls this morning, and it's we feel highly intimidating. They're intimidating their members to stay in the union by telling them all the bad things will happen to them if they leave, and that's not really the spirit of the Supreme Court decision. We should be free to exercise our rights, not be coerced into not exercising them. Well, they're just, I think there are certain things, and we, we'll, we'll bring some labor leaders in here to talk about this, because I think there are some things that unions could do just aesthetically to make things a little bit easier. I was, I was disappointed to hear that with the nurses' strike, now this is, this is, this is not public employees, right, this is the nurses, right. uh, but with the nurses' strike, when the vote came down, it was a show of hands. You know, voting voting on, 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 on negotiations by a show of hands is is innately intimidating. The idea that you know somebody who says no on a pending deal or whichever way it goes, that kind of groupthink encouragement or you know showcasing those who dissent, uh, you know, puts people in a bad spot. If, if voting for for candidates 
and financial issues on election day is a private exercise. I would think that union votes ought to be a private exercise as well. Well, uh, I don't uh, know what that has to do with this story you're well, referring to. Well, it has a to, lot, actually, because we'd like to see something. You know, most public teachers and, and uh, firemen and police and other government employees never have voted to certify the union that was designated to represent them decades ago by the government. They've just automatically been entered into the union and they have had no say as to whether they like or dislike. Now that at least they can vote with their pocketbook by saying, no, I don't like the way my union's either treating me or policies or the political spending. But we also think there ought to be recertification votes, you know, periodically, that union members should vote to say, do you or do you not want this specific union to be your exclusive bargaining agent as, as designated by the government? Most union members have never had the chance to vote on that. All right. Again, what, uh, will this be a blip, or was it, is no. this something that will uh, will take hold? We'll we'll talk about that in our next segment. See what So this letter that you you pointed to is a local letter. Is this a uh, a letter to? Local, yeah, it's the Bristol Warren Education Association, which is a, the local of and, and it warns, Rhode Island, it, warns yeah. it warns members of, the, of that local teacher association that they won't be able to vote on union matters, that you cannot attend union meetings or functions, building reps will not attend meetings to represent you. Uh, if you file a grievance, you'll need to pay an a, you know a union attorney, uh, and outside lawyers aren't allowed to, to represent you. That's uh, false. You, you, well, th that's false. False. Not according to the law, you say that's false. Well, it's deceptive. Deceptive in that the contract language may state that you can only use union lawyers if you file a grievance through the union grievance system. But employees have the right. Still, our equal opportunity laws still um, 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 are apply, and right. they can well, go well, outside a, the process and use their own private lawyers if they choose. Although, to. All, although, the, and the, uh, although and there the are groups that the, the exclusive agents. So it's that, that, that I think that's probably. A jump ball. That I, that's probably a point of contention, right? Uh, they won't it assist is. you on appeals, and you won't be able to request uh, days from the sick leave bank. I mean, that's that's well. If if most of that is true, you know, union members will have to decide for themselves uh, whether this all or nothing decision uh, benefits them. What, what's your projection? Will we see an increase of union people not paying dues? Yes or no? Oh, I'm sure we will. I mean, it's happened, like I said, it's 15 to 30 percent in other states once they've been informed. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not keeping count. That's not our goal uh, to do that. Our goal, in fact, we have a button on the website that says, I visited your website, I've read the information, I choose to stay in my union. We want to provide a public service to these public servants, but, but when they're told they can't get overtime, they can't get promotions, the Supreme Court law doesn't apply to them, or they're threatened that you can, you can only do this, or that's not that's not good information, and, and we decided we needed to do something about that. Um, and we'll uh, we'll contact uh, local labor leaders for their point of view on this as well. Appreciate it, Mike. Thanks, Thanks very man. much. A final word, and we come back. So now we get back to the politics uh, of the week, and tomorrow night, Giovanni Ferrosi, uh, whose candidacy is completely perplexing to me, will be here. Uh, he is the Republican candidate who has been debating Patricia Morgan, and only Patricia Morgan, because Alan Fung hasn't shown up to any yet, although Fung has committed to a wound socket radio debate with the other two. Uh, I don't know what he's doing. Raising money, I can't figure it out. Uh, but we will uh, we'll talk with him tomorrow, because he's got plenty to say. So tune in for that. We'll see you on the radio at 3 on WPRO. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.